curious position where all the students are ready, but it's the adults that I need to get in order. So if everyone could take their seats and we may begin. I want to introduce our, our opening speaker. And in order to do so, I'd like you to, to cast your mind back 50 years to a time when the space program is really ramping up. And this is the, the climax of an effort which had been announced many years before by the President of the United States to say, we are going to go to the moon. We're going to step foot on that thing. And I don't know how many of you appreciate how far away the moon is. It looks pretty close when it's up there. It's actually a very, very long way away. And the notion of launching one of these things with a couple of people inside of it, as it's sometimes described, you know, a tin can on top of a very large bomb, sending that upwards, ideally, and getting it to the moon and landing on the moon and getting out and walking around and taking a lot of selfies and then getting back on and coming back again successfully is staggering. I can't imagine what it was like to do that. I can't even imagine what it was like to watch that because I was born in 1971 when that program was coming to an end. But it has lasting uh, impressions on generations. And now looking back on that 50 years and thinking ahead about where we're going with space exploration next, it's an amazing time. But I want you to think about that moment. And I want you to think about that time when space exploration and the space race, humans as a space-faring species, has really captured the, the popular attention. And almost everyone on the planet who's under the age of about 30, I'm guessing, wanted to be an astronaut at that point because they're the stars of the show. But I want you to imagine a young man, age of six, in a particularly fetching NASA astronaut Halloween costume, gazing out through a photograph, thinking about a future career in space, but not necessarily as an astronaut, not as the one who gets out and wanders around on the moon. Someone who looked at, at the whole operation the launching of the rockets, the mission control, the people on the consoles making it happen and thought, that's what I want to do. That's, that's the bit for me. I want to make this happen. I want to understand how you get the people in the tin can on top of the bomb to the moon. How do we make that happen? And a future career in space flight and space exploration then followed. Our first speaker spent 12 years subsequently, after graduating from Texas A&M University, spent 12 years with the Space Shuttle Flight Dynamics team. It's a flight dyna dynamics officer. 12 years with that program. Before going to Canada to work with the ISS, I'd like to say we had the acronym first, International Science School, thank you very much, the International Space Station Operations System up in Canada, before coming back down to the States and returning to, to JSC and being selected by NASA as a flight director in the year 2000 and led mission control center flight control teams for the space shuttle mission and for international space station operations for over 18 years. Earlier this year, after we had contacted him, I got in touch with our speaker to say, you're a, you're a flight director at NASA, you should come and talk to us. And he said, well, I've actually just changed jobs. So as if working with the space shuttle and then the ISS wasn't, wasn't interesting enough. Then has taken on a new role very recently with NASA, working with the uh, operations integration and support of NASA's newest human exploration programs, which is the, the SLS, the Space Launch System, and the Orion programs, which is the next phase of us getting back out there to the moon, but then beyond, looking beyond that. It's an incredible career, and it's not over yet. I'd like you to welcome to the stage, with thunderous applause from NASA, Matt Abbott. All right. Well, well, thank you. First of all, um, thank you, Chris, for the, the wonderful introduction. Uh, thank you for the invitation to come speak with you uh, today. Um, the, the history and the, of the, the uh, International Science School, the University of Sydney, 
is really palpable, it, tangible. I can feel it here, and, and it's, it's a great honor to be here with you. It's actually very humbling, honestly, to be here with you and to be here with the scholars who are going to take us uh, the next 50 years. Um, what I'd like to talk about is expanding the frontier, kind of what we've done since the Apollo moon landings to where we're going with the, what we're calling the Artemis program. Um, I do want to point out that on this, uh, this cover, cover slide, uh, that's not just a black background there. That photograph actually was taken by OSIRIS-REx, the asteroid mission of the Earth and the Moon in the same frame. And uh, Chris was talking about how far away the Moon is from the Earth, and uh, that really emphasizes to me, uh, first of all, how, how far we have to go just to get to the Moon, and also how, how isolated and special we are really here on Earth. So it, it's, really, uh, it's really something to, to take a look at that. And, know that everyone who was in this room was, is in that picture on, on the Earth there. Um, Chris mentioned my, my career as a flight director. Um, as, as he said, I, I recently moved on to, uh, to do some uh, integration work with the, the new programs, but um, each flight director gets to choose kind of a team name. Um, I was the 55th flight director selected in the history of the, the space program at, in, at NASA. The first flight director, Chris Kraft, was the first three flight directors, Chris Kraft, Gene Kranz, and, and John Hodge, were red, white, and blue flight. Um, and since then, each, each flight director has selected a team name, a color, a constellation, an element, uh, something that represents them. And, and I just put this up there to show you my, my own logo that we, back then, they didn't design their own logos, we do now. Um, that represents the qualities that, to me, represent uh, the, 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 our, our efforts to continue to fly safely and successfully um, in space. Uh, the knowledge and understanding one is very important, uh, knowing our spacecraft, knowing our systems, but really knowing ourselves and, and understanding our own limitations and our own capabilities. Uh, cooperation and teamwork is about being able to have those hard conversations, being able to have arguments and discussions and debates about how we're going to move, move forward, and then pick something, choose something, and move forward as a, as a team. Creativity is about learning, learning, about, uh, learning from what we've done, from our experience, and trying to find new ways of, of, of uh, moving forward, and then adventure is, is an obvious one. But the other thing I wanted to point out is that the name really harkens back to the Apollo days and to the lunar module Aquarius, where, where all those qualities came together to help get the, the astronauts home. So to start off, actually, I'd like to show you a quick uh, a two-minute uh, uh, video here uh, just to kind of kick us off, and then we'll get back to it. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. T-minus 60 seconds and counting. We are go for Apollo 7 at this time. And from the crew of Apollo 8, we close with good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on the good earth. We have ignition sequence start. Engines on five, four, three, two. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. That's one small step for man. One giant leap for mankind. We leave as we came, and God willing, as we shall return. With peace and hope for all mankind. Right away, Houston. From 1969 to 1972, we had you know, a total of six moon landings. 12 humans walked on the surface of the moon. We have elevated the human condition. We have improved human lives. We have raised the standard of living for every person on Earth because of space exploration. We're gonna go back to the moon and we're gonna take what we learned there and we're gonna to go to Mars. takes me right back to being six years old. Um, so uh, frontiers, 
I know the theme uh, uh, for ISS 2019 is, is frontiers, and I looked up the definition of frontier because I, I wanted to make sure that I had the right mindset uh, as I thought about this talk. Um, there's the obvious ones about the borders between countries and, and, uh, and regions uh, of, of settled or developed territory, ex expanding knowledge and limitations, uh, uh, lines of division, uh, and, and new fields for uh, de developmental activity. But the other thing that's important, I think, to think about is frontiers can apply not only to big things like the universe and human civilization and territorial boundaries, but to internal limits, things inside ourselves and, and, and microscopic limits in, in medicine and, 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 uh, and chemistry, and really to each of us personally. And that's kind of what I want to frame this, this talk on is, is what we've done since the Apollo missions and, and where we're going kind of framed in, in my own experience as a kid back in the Apollo days and, and as a, in my career as we move through, the, uh, uh, through to, to today. So uh, looking back, um, Project Mercury um, flew uh, the crewed missions from 1961 to 1963. There were six of them that were crewed, uh, five uncrewed missions that started earlier in 1959. During the Project Mercury phase, it was really about learning how to, to uh, how, how people would behave and, and interact in, in with their with their spacecraft in orbit, and basically just how can we get there? Can we can we operate normally when we're in space? That was followed by the uh, the the Gemini project, which flew 12 missions, 10 of which were crewed between 1964 and 1966. Uh, Gemini was expanding the frontiers a bit in terms of of living and working in space. We we learned how to do spacewalks. That's uh, Ed White doing the first U.S. spacewalk outside of the Gemini Gemini capsule. We also learned about Earth orbit rendezvous and how to to make two vehicles come together. In, in orbit around a, a, a planet. Um, not as easy as it sounds. It's not just point yourself at the other vehicle and fire your thrusters. Uh, it gets pretty complicated due to the orbital mechanics of the situation. Moving on to the Apollo program, things started off uh, with, with a very, it, with tragedy in 1967 when, uh, when the three astronauts of the Apollo 1 mission during a test on the launch pad were killed in a fire uh, in the spacecraft. Gus Grissom, Roger Chafee, and Ed White, who you saw on the previous uh, slide, who was doing the spacewalk in the Gemini capsule, were, were killed uh, and, uh, in, a, in a fire. Um, following that was a year and a half of redesign and testing of the vehicle, both the spacecraft and the launch vehicle, but also a lot of soul searching for the, the mission control team and for the, all the teams on the ground to try to make sure we understand how not to let things like that happen again. Um, the, I, I want to say that lessons learned from, from that fire continue to this day in terms of spacecraft design, even through ISS, and I mean ISS, the spaceship, not the school, um, and, and how to avoid fires on spacecraft and how to minimize the effects of a fire if a fire does occur. Moving on to the, uh, through the uh, Apollo uh, missions, the first crewed Apollo flight actually happened in 1968, about, an hour, uh, about a year and a half after the fire, um, where uh, uh, the, the crew practiced transposition and docking techniques, which was really separating the Apollo spacecraft from the upper stage of the launch vehicle and kind of driving it away, turning around, and then coming back to dock with the lunar module. Now, there was no lunar module for Apollo 7. It, it wasn't ready yet, but it was, there was a docking target there, and it was basically a test of the procedures to, to affect that rendezvous. Um, as it turns out, something else that was learned, if you look at the, the four kind of uh, petals that are open that, that expose the, the payload uh, area of the upper stage, one of the petals, the one on the lower right, is not open all the way. And that was a design change that was made for future missions to jettison those pedals and get rid of them completely so that they wouldn't get stuck in a, in a position where they might, have a, might hamper the ability to get the lunar module out. Apollo 8, um, you heard a little bit of, of this. This is the famous uh, reading from the book of Genesis on at Christmas Eve from the crew as they, as they, as they orbited the, Earth, the, the moon and the, the famous Earthrise photo uh, from, from Apollo 8, which is, it, to me, still just 
kind of stops me in my tracks when I see it to this day. Um, it was the first crewed flight, first time we flew people on a spacecraft attached to a Saturn V rocket. So it was the first time the Saturn V had flown with people on top of it. And uh, Frank Mormon, Jim Lovell, and Bill Anders um, were, were the, the crew. They originally were planned as a high Earth orbit uh, lunar module test flight. But the lunar module wasn't ready to, at the time that the, the mission was going to fly. And so only five months before the launch, the mission was changed from a, a lunar module test flight in high Earth orbit to a command and service module flight all the way to the moon to put the crew into, into uh, uh, lunar orbit for, for 10 orbits. So very ambitious, very risky to, to, to take the second flight of a spacecraft and the first flight of a launch vehicle and, and send the crew to the moon. But it was very successful and very inspiring. The missions that followed include Apollo 9, where the, the lunar module was, uh, was tested in Earth orbit. Um, I always love this picture because it's the lunar module kind of over the ocean, and it looks kind of weird. Um, but that was, that was intended to, to test out the systems and, and make sure that all the, 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 uh, the vehicles were functioning properly before moving on to Apollo 10. Apollo 10 was a complete dress rehearsal for Apollo 11, except for the moon landing. Um, Tom Stafford and, and Gene Cernan took the, the lunar module to less than nine miles from the surface of the moon, just to the point where they would do a powered, what they called the powered descent. And then they jettisoned the descent module and, and took the ascent module back up to rendezvous with the command module where John Young was waiting for them. And uh, uh, again, very successful mission. They did everything almost that, that Apollo 11 did except for the, the landing. Of course, Apollo 11 is, is one reason we're, we're celebrating what, uh, what happened 50 years ago this month, and that was the, the moon landing. When you think about the speech that John Kennedy gave in 1962, that was only halfway through the Mercury program. Um, and it was only about eight years, or seven years actually, from the end of the decade. John Kennedy set a, a very ambitious goal, an almost impossible to achieve goal when you think about it, um, with a very specific end date, uh, target date, and charged the, the, uh, the country and the team to, to make that happen. And uh, amazingly, despite the tragedy of Apollo 1 and despite other, other challenges that were faced through the, the missions in between, the, the, the goal was satisfied in, in July, on July 20th, 1969, when, when uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landed on the moon in, in the uh, Eagle lunar module. What followed were, were several more missions uh, to the moon, Apollo 12. Very interesting about Apollo 12 is the, the, the missions subsequent to Apollo 11 were, were to different landing sites, all with different kind of reasons for choosing the site. They were uh, potentially for using, uh, for looking at at the lunar highlands or lunar valleys and different geological structures on the moon. Apollo 12, though, was very interesting because they chose the landing site to be near the Surveyor 3 mission, which was an unmanned uh, spacecraft that was sent to the moon in April 1967 in order to gather data for the Apollo program. So here in this picture, Pete Conrad is, is standing next to Surveyor 3, which was landed, as I said, in 1967, uh, about uh, a couple of years prior to, to the, this moon landing taken by Alan Bean. Alan Bean uh, actually became an artist after his, his uh, retirement from NASA, and he had, uh, a, did a lot of, of work painting uh, scenes that kind of brought the, the, the lunar missions to life for him from, from basically the, the, the feelings that he experienced when, uh, during those missions. Apollo 13, another one that people are very familiar with. Uh, Jim Lovell, Jack Swigert, and Fred Hayes experienced a failure, an explosion on their service module on the way to the moon. And, um, and without the lunar module Aquarius and some very creative ways of, of making use of, of different, uh, different materials and, and things on the spacecraft, we're able to get home uh, safely and successfully. So uh, again, that's a whole talk unto itself. Apollo 14, um, another flight of uh, a lot of scientific experiments deployed on the moon. This one was to the lunar highlands. Apollo 15 uh, was the first use of the lunar roving vehicle, um, uh, kind of a go-kart uh, that the, the crew could use to drive around on the moon. You can kind of see the tracks leading away from the, the lunar module there um, toward, toward the foreground. 
Um, it was also the first deep space spacewalk during the return. During the trip back from the moon, Al Warden, the command module pilot, uh, did a spacewalk outside of the command module to retrieve uh, some film canisters and, and experiments from the service module before it was jettisoned. Apollo 16 uh, was the second one to the uh, lunar highlands and also the second use of the rover. And then Apollo 17 was the last mission to the moon uh, with uh, Gene Cernan, Ron Evans, and Harrison Schmidt. Harrison Schmidt being the, the only scientist who actually uh, flew as one of the uh, astronauts to the moon. Most of the others were test pilots and, and, uh, and engineers. Uh, Harrison Schmidt was a geologist, which was, was really great to get a geologist actually there to, to firsthand see the, the, the uh, environment. The next uh, three missions at the time were canceled due to budget and political pressures. Uh, so Apollo 18, 19, and 20 were never flown. Um, uh, getting back to something that Chris was talking about, a uh, picture here of Gene Kranz, uh, white flight um, in, a, in a training exercise back in the 60s. As Chris said, there was something about this view of mission control that captured the attention of me as a six-year-old, a seven-year-old, an eight-year-old back in that time of my life. Space was everywhere. Uh, the, the toys, the TV shows, the cereal boxes, the, the everything that you, every, everywhere you turned, there was interest in space. And, and something grabbed me about mission control back then. And that really shaped my future forever. And my frontier, as a six to nine year old kid at the time, was limited to my neighborhood. I, I you know, my neighborhood, my school, it, it, it was, wasn't anything beyond that. But something about this picture made me do whatever I could to make it happen. <laughs> Um, and th the passion had been ignited in me, and, uh, and so this was from Halloween, I think somewhere around 1971. Um, but that was when, when really when things started for me. The next couple of years, uh, NASA, as I said, the Apollo lunar missions were, were canceled, but Skylab had already been in development, and the Skylab mission was a, a, a one single launch space station uh, meaning a single launch, meaning it wasn't assembled in orbit, but it was sent up in, with one Saturn V flight in 1973. But the interesting thing about it, it was damaged on the way up when uh, the, um, uh, the launch shroud tore away some of the micrometeoroid shielding and tore away one of the solar arrays from the side of the spacecraft and forced the other solar, solar array to become stuck in a partially deployed position. So the first mission to Skylab, the first crewed mission using an Apollo spacecraft, was spent installing a, uh, a gold sun shield over the, the portion of the vehicle that had the shielding ripped away so that it would, could pr be protected from the thermal environment, from the sun bearing down on it. And the astronauts also deployed that other solar array to the one that's standing up vertically uh, to the right of the picture, the right side of the picture, um, to, so that the, the station could have its, its normal, you know, at least a half of its normal power generation capability. So it was the first time we've actually worked on and repaired a, a vehicle besides the Apollo 13 uh, return um, in, in space. And, and that's something that's paid dividends and we, we've continued to learn from since then. Uh, in 1975, uh, the Apollo-Soyuz test project was held, and that's an early precursor to the partnerships that are so strong today. Even in the face of other political pressures, the, the partnership in the International Space Station program is, is really strong and has, has stood the test of time, even as, as politics have, and, and, and geopolitical uh, aspects have, have come into play. Okay, now we're in the mid-70s, uh, 1977. Uh, the Space Shuttle uh, Enterprise, which was never designed to fly in space, but was designed as a test vehicle to, for approach and landing tests and, and uh, some fit checks on the launch pad, um, was doing some, uh, some basically uh, shooting approaches to the runway at Edwards Air Force Base. I'll take this back to where I was at the time. I was in high school. I just finished up my freshman year. Uh, I was taking a computer course over the summer uh, at, a, at one of the other high schools in the district. Um, at the time, computers were the size of a room. I mean, they were big. They were, they were big, unwieldy. They were, they were not very interactive. Um, 
the, the course I was taking was in programming and, and it was on a terminal that was basically a typewriter attached to a printer, no screen. There was no screens or anything like that. And, and I remember very vividly that, that summer day in August of 1977, getting on my bike and riding home from that computer course as fast as I could to get home in time to see the approach and landing tests of the shuttle. Um, one of the things back then, <laughs> gathering information was difficult. Um, there was no internet, no cell phones, no tablets, no laptops, no email, no text messaging. You got your informa information from newspapers. You had to page through newspapers looking for the little article in the corner of the third section that might be about, about the space program. There were books, libraries obviously, that were usually years old and, and kind of out of date. Encyclopedias, um, only three or four television stations, no cable stations, no 600 channels of, of everything you could imagine, and no practical video recording capability. So, it was on when it was on and you either saw it or you didn't. If you didn't see it, well you missed it and you might catch it on the news later, but you had to be watching when the news was on. Um, letter writing was another way of, of communicating. I remember writing letters to NASA and asking, when's the space shuttle gonna launch? And getting nice letters back saying, well here's what we think and here's some, some materials that, that you, know, can, you, you might find interesting, some pamphlets and things like that. Obviously today with, with instant communication and information at your fingertips all the time, it's amazing what you students have at your fingertips that, that was really hard for me to find 40 years ago uh, when I was in, in high school. By 1981, it was the time uh, of STS-1, the first space shuttle mission. I was now in college at the University of Buffalo. I grew up in Buffalo, New York. Um, and and uh, I, I went to school, began school there. Um, it was close to home, could live at home. Um, and I remember, again, very vividly coming home from school, uh, getting home from school in time to watch the, uh, the first space shuttle launch. Um, many don't realize the risks that were taken by John Young and Bob Crippen when they flew the space shuttle for the first time. Um, it's the first time a vehicle of this size, of this complexity was flown with astronauts on board from the very beginning. So there was no test flight of the space shuttle before that. They were on board for the ride no matter what happened with the vehicle. They did have ejection seats which were minimally useful um, during certain phases of flight. But, but it was a real achievement to get the space shuttle to finally launch uh, in 1981. That was a, a big deal for me. STS-1 and, and the several missions that followed um, caused me to rethink where I was in college. Um, I read an article about cooperative education programs, student programs, um, written by a Texas A&M co-op student who happened to be working at the Johnson Space Center. And I remember a chart that showed all the co-ops at, at the Johnson Space Center, about 50% of them were from one of two schools in Texas, Texas A&M and the U University of Texas. So, I decided at that time that that's probably where I needed to go if I wanted to get a job at the Johnson Space Center. I'd never been there before. I'd never been to Texas before. Um, my personal frontier just expanded a whole lot when I, when I transferred to, to Texas A&M. I signed up for the program. Uh, I got an interview with the, the representative from the Johnson Space Center. And through some good questioning by him, he decided, I think you want to be in flight ops. Good call, because um, by the time STS-6 rolled around, which was the maiden voyage of Challenger in 1983, in April, I was a co-op student in the flight dynamics section at JSC, and I was in the flight dynamics back room, sitting on the floor next to the landing support officer, who had found a little place for me to be there that was out of the way of all the people who were doing real work during the launch, and I was plugged in listening to the communications loops during the launch, 14 years after Apollo 1, 14 years, af years after that six-year-old saw the moon landings and mission control, and here I was sitting in a back room for mission control um, in, in my first uh, semester as a co-op student at JSC. And I got to meet some pretty cool people, too. Um, yes, I had hair back then. Um, <laughs> anyway, but Gene Kranz was the, the head of flight operations at the time, and, uh, 
and it was it was great to be able to work for him and with him uh, for the uh, until he retired in 1992. About six months after I graduated from Texas A&M and went back to work full time, uh, another tragedy, another catastrophe, uh, the Challenger uh, accident occurred in January of 1986. Um, Dick Scobie, Mike Smith, Judy Resnick, Ron McNair, Ellison Onizuka. Greg Jarvis and school teacher Krista McAuliffe were killed during a, a, an accident that uh, I think you're all aware of during, during the launch phase. Once again, the team had to dig deep, really a, a new generation of the team had to dig deep to learn from the tragedy and honor them and their legacy. Um, we knew that the, that the Challenger crew would, would not want things to stop. We would want, they would want us to fix the problems, figure out what happened and, and move on from there. Strangely, through that, um, that, that tragedy, as, as actually as often happens, there were opportunities. Uh, for me as a young engineer, I had a chance to do a lot of training and simulations as a flight dynamics officer. So it accelerated my training because all of the, the certified teams were working the recovery efforts and working the, the, to understand how we can make sure that we, we can move forward from the accident. And so, I had another hair shot. Um, another, uh, I had the opportunity to, to work a lot of simulations and got certified a lot sooner than, than I, I think I would have had the accident uh, uh, not occurred when it did. Uh, as a flight dynamics officer, I got to pick, take part in the launch of, of several uh, scientific spacecraft, including the Hubble Space Telescope deployment mission, uh, the Galileo mission to Jupiter, uh, Magellan and Ulysses. So it was, it was a, a real treat for me to be able to be participants in some of those um, from the space shuttle side that went on to, to major scientific discoveries. As Chris mentioned, um, after 12 years as a flight dynamics officer, uh, after working a total of 40 missions, mostly launches and landings, came an opportunity to go up to Canada and work for CSA in Montreal at the Canadian Space Agency headquarters there um, as they prepared their robotic systems for the, the soon to fly ISS spaceship, not the school. Um, it snows up there. I love it. I love snow. I love four seasons. I was glad to get it back up north. But after a couple of years there, I realized that the, the, the large team building aspects that I experienced at JSC in mission control were really appealing to me. And while I was there in Canada in May of 2000, there was an announcement that came out so they were looking for flight directors. And I thought, wow, I've just been here for a couple of years. Um, I wanted to see the arm fly. I wanted to kind of have that closure. But it was time. And so I applied and was accepted and got selected as a flight director at the, at the end of the year 2000 and was back in Houston in 2001. In time to be sitting with my friend uh, and coworker, uh, a former coworker, John Curry, uh, who was the flight director, the lead for the mission that deployed the space station remote manip manipulator system, the Canadian arm to the space station. So as a new flight director, as part of my training, I got to sit with John during the whole mission and kind of, I had some expertise that I could, I could provide for him and I could learn how, how things worked as a flight director from him. And so I guess the message here is sometimes you, you don't really know where an opportunity is going to, going to take you. Um, it might take you right back to where you started. Uh, or, or close to it, um, but it's it's important to to not not be afraid of taking taking chances and 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 taking that next step in your career. Another tragedy occurred in 2003. Um, the STS-107 crew: uh, Rick Husband, Willie McCool, Mike Anderson, Ilan Ramon, Kalpa Nachala, Dave Brown, and Laura, Laura Clark. Um, flying a standalone science mission, not to the International Space Station, were lost during reentry on February 1st, 2003. Um, at this time, space station assembly was well underway, but it was halted during the investigation and the recovery, and the space station crew was reduced from, from three crew members to two for the period of time while the investigations and the, rec the recovery efforts went on after, after the, uh, the accident. Despite the two-person crew operations initially described um, in the press as caretaker crews, meaning they were kind of a couple people up there just to kind of keep the lights on, the international teams were still able to complete significant science, um, 
objectives uh, until the shuttle returned to flight. So it was, it was really an, uh, a, a great pleasure to be able to help, help um, uh, with that effort. I was the lead flight director for Expedition 9, which was the, uh, the third two-person two crew to the, uh, to the space station. It was a six-month mission. And, um, and we were able to get some, some significant science done, which was, which was fantastic. That is a picture of what the International Space Station looked like in 2003 when the Columbia accident occurred. And this is what the space station looked like at assembly complete. Um, quite a bit different, uh, quite a bit bigger. Uh, once the shuttle was returned to flight, ISS assembly, assembly continued until it was completed uh, in 2011. And um, then that remarkable flying machine that the space shuttle was was retired after 135 missions and 30 years of service. Um, really an incredible flying machine, and that's, that was described that way by John Young after, after STS-1, and, and it's, it really is true to this day. Uh, the achievements and the things that, were, were, that were, we were able to do with the space shuttle were really, really remarkable. To, to build the International Space Station took 27 uh, shuttle missions over the span of 13 years. Um, each mission was, had to be carefully sequenced in order to ensure the structural integrity of the vehicle, but also to make sure all the power and data connections were made and meeting increasing demands for science um, and, and science, science operations and, and crew operations. If you can imagine a lab, uh, a laboratory um, you know, down the street, um, on the ground with researchers living in it. So they're living in it and they're working in it. And now you're going to expand it. So you need to knock a wall out, probably hang up some big plastic sheeting and, and put some new, um, uh, you know, new laboratory space in. But hey, you want to keep the laboratory that you've got going to the best extent possible while you do that. That's basically what was happening for the duration of space station assembly. We were able to keep the science going, keep the operations going while we continued to expand the capabilities of the vehicle, which was, was pretty spectacular. Today, the completed ISS spans the area of an American football field. It kind of would cover the, the football field, as you can see in the picture there. The internal volume is the size of a five to six bedroom house with, a, with two bathrooms, a, a sort of a gym, a 360 degree bay window for, for looking at the earth, and um, dozens of computers controlling over 1.5 million lines of code uh, to keep the whole thing operating. There are six crew members spending six-month missions uh, each on, on board the space station. It's flying 250 miles above Earth, going 17,500 miles an hour, which is once around every 90 minutes. And it's been continuously occupied. This November will be 19 years since, uh, since the, the first crew was launched, and it's been continuously op occupied the whole time. The international partnership is one of the crown jewels of the ISS program. Um, the partnership, Canada, Japan, the Russian Federation, the U.S., and the, there's 11 member states of the European Space Agency um, make up that partnership and through control centers around the world are, are the ones who, who make it all happen, who do the planning, who do plan the science, who, who execute the missions. Um, and it's, it's really a testament to what people can do when we, they work together. Some of our speakers earlier were talking about that as, as, as people, and we all work together as a, as, a, as a community on the planet. It's amazing what we can do. There are several independent lab modules on board ISS. There's US laboratory space, Russian space, Jap Japanese and, and European uh, modules. The, uh, the Japanese uh, experiment module, uh, Kibo, uh, uh, module has a science airlock and a robotic arm outside that can deploy payloads externally. We've learned to build, maintain, and repair systems and vehicles both inside and, out and outside um, through the course of the, the, uh, the years that the space station has been operational. We've learned about accommodating visiting vehicles, both ones that actively dock and fly themselves in and, and, and connect themselves to the space station, and those that are robotically grabbed and installed by flying up close to the space station and then getting grabbed by the robot arm. And most importantly, we've learned and are continuing to learn how to live, work, and play in space as people. Um, when your home is your workplace, you've really got no place to get away from it all. And, and so the crews really have to have their time and space to be able to, to, uh, to enjoy their own personal time as well. 
So in my 18 years as a flight director, um, I supported over 700 shifts on the, on, between ISS and space shuttle missions. I served as lead flight director for two space shuttle missions, two ISS expeditions, and one SpaceX Dragon cargo mission. And uh, it, was, it, it couldn't have been more rewarding to me uh, for that phase of my career, and it was considerable, a considerable phase for 18 years. Looking to the future, um, there are a couple of, of vehicles that are in development and fly, or getting ready to fly or have flown right now. Uh, SpaceX has their crewed uh, Dragon spacecraft. This photograph was taken back in March during its, its uncrewed test flight to the space station. And uh, Boeing has their CST-100 Starliner, um, which is expected to fly later this year in, a, in an uncrewed um, configuration and then followed uh, by crewed, crewed missions by both SpaceX and Boeing. So that ISS experience, I want to say just right here, is, is key to where we're going in the future. The, the strong international and commercial partnerships, the ability, as I said before, to construct huge structures remotely uh, using elements that are provided from different countries, different companies that were never assembled in one place on the ground before they flew. In fact, some of the modules and some of the, the, the vehicles were never, didn't even exist when the, the, the vehicle was, the ISS was, was conceived. We've learned how to do vehicle operations very efficiently to let the crew, free the crew up for science and payload activities. We've got multiple resupply capabilities and soon we'll have multiple crew launch capabilities and we're continuing to learn how to safely protect the crews and maintain the vehicle over, over a span of dec literally decades. So that all took time, and it all had to happen close to home because you need to be able to, to, uh, to fix things pretty quickly in, when you're starting to learn how to, how to do remote operations. It's kind of, we were talking earlier uh, today about camping. You know, if you're going to go camping in the wilderness or up on the mountains, if you've never camped before, you might want to try it in your backyard first. So if you realize you forgot something, you can run in the house and get it. Um, so you, you've got to be able to, to, uh, to take advantage of the experience we've, we've had with ISS and now carry that forward to the next programs. Um, the space launch system is well under development and is being constructed, um, and the Orion spacecraft is, is as well. Orion actually flew uh, in a, in a uh, test configuration mission uh, back in 2012. Uh, things have, have moved quite a bit on since then, and we're now looking at late, two th late 2020 to, to fly a uh, uh, space launch system Orion combination in an unmanned configuration to the moon. So looking ahead, the, the Artemis program, as, as it's, it's been named, um, is really about getting astronaut crews back to the moon in a very short order. Um, the goal that has been set for us by the administration is 2024 to get people back to the moon. Very ambitious goal, once again. Um, we have a launch vehicle in development. We have a spacecraft in development. What's in between there has to, that still has to be developed is there's a, a spacecraft called Gateway, which will be an orbiting space station around the moon um, that will be a destination for Orion and for the crews from which they can get into a lander and descend to the moon. So there's a lot of, of development work going on in all, the, all these areas. We're leaning on commercial partners and commercial capabilities. There's a lot of interest in, in helping to make all this happen. And as we go forward into the second phase of, of the, uh, uh, the gateway, we're also looking for international partnerships. And there's the, the, basically the, the, uh, that work has already started to, to establish the international partnerships um, with, uh, with NASA. So our frontier is expanding. Um, we're on the cusp of permanently expanding our presence in our local neighborhood. With the space station, we've had people in space for 19 years continuously, even through tragedy, even through the, the Columbia accident. We have continued to fly crews. We've continued to have people on, uh, on board the, the vehicle. We're, we're on the verge of expanding that to our local neighborhood, to the moon, kind of moving from the front porch to the backyard or the front yard, but then onto the planets and the stars from there. So for you students, um, there are really countless opportunities that are going to be available to you to participate. They may not always look like what you expect at the time, um, but they're there. And uh, the international and commercial partnerships are really a key to that success. Um, but I do want to say that in any endeavor, it's about the relationships. It's about the people. The people are what make it happen. The people are what made 
the Apollo missions happen. The people are what made the International Space Station missions happen. The people are what will make the next 50 years possible. So it's you who are going to carry us forward to the, over the next 50 years. It's you that are going to make that happen. So as I like to remind my kids, get your head up out of your phone and actually talk to people <laughs> and, and, and work with your colleagues, work with your friends, work with people who are not in the same field of, of expertise as you. Work with, with, with others who you can learn from. You might, you might learn something that can help you expand something in your own world. But that, that's a, it's, a, it's a really incredible time to, to, be, uh, to be growing up and, and getting out into the workforce. So just a few takeaways from this, this talk. One is find your passion. Find what drives you and find what, what really, um, really makes you, you'll find that it will draw you into it um, as you, uh, if, if you find what really makes you go. And push yourself to do the hard things. In John Kennedy's speech, he talked about, we do these things not because they are easy, but because they are hard. We do them because they're hard. We want to aim really high, because aiming really high, even if you fall short of your goal, you're pushing the envelope, you're pushing the boundaries quite a bit further. Look for opportunities. But if you don't see the opportunities, make the opportunities. You, you, can, you can do it. You can, you can find, the op find things to, to do, people to talk to, ask questions. One of the things that I've always thought is if you're polite, you ask questions, and you try to avoid attaching expectations to what's going to happen, you'd be amazed at, at how many times you ask, ask if you can do something or participate in something, and the answer is, yeah, come on. So, don't be afraid to, to make the opportunities for yourself. Um, stay flexible. Luck happens, bad luck and good luck. Um, the, the path that you take to your goal uh, may not look like what you've expected it to. You might take a turn, you might even move backwards a little bit, but, but as long as, as your passion is, is true and, and, and your goal is clear, you will turn towards it uh, ultimately. And finally, have fun and explore. That's really what it's all about. It's about working together as a, as a community and exploring the, uh, the universe. So before we go on to, to, I think we have a little bit of time for questions unless I went too long. <laughs> um, got one more short video to show you and then we'll, we'll do some questions. 50 years ago, we pioneered a path to the moon. The trail we blazed, cut through the fictions of science and showed us all what was possible. Today, our calling to explore is even greater. To go farther, we must be able to sustain missions of greater distance and duration. We must use the resources we find at our destinations. We must overcome radiation, isolation, gravity, and extreme environments like never before. These are the challenges we face to push the bounds of humanity. We're going to the moon to stay by 2024, and this is how. This all starts with the ability to get larger, heavier payloads off planet and beyond Earth's gravity. For this, we design an entirely new rocket. A space launch system. SLS will be the most powerful rocket ever developed. And with components in production. And more in testing. This system is capable of being the catalyst for deep space missions. We need a capsule. That can support humans from launch through deep space and return safely back to Earth. For this, we've built Orion. This is NASA's next generation human space capsule. Using data from lunar orbiters that continue to reveal the moon's hazards and resources, we're currently developing an entirely new approach to landing and operating on the moon. Using our commercial partners to deliver science instruments and robotics to the surface, we are paving the way for human missions in 2024. Our charge is to go quickly and to stay to press our collective efforts forward with a fervor that will see us return to the moon in a manner that is wholly different than 50 years ago. We want lunar landers that are reusable, that can land anywhere on the lunar surface. The simplest way to do so is to give them a platform in orbit around the moon from which to transition. An orbiting platform to host deep space experiments and be a waypoint for human capsules. We call this lunar outpost Gateway. The beauty of the gateway is that it can be moved between orbits. It will balance between the Earth and Moon's gravity, 
in a position that is ideal for launching even deeper space missions. In 2009, we learned that the moon contains millions of tons of water ice. This ice can be extracted and purified for water. It can be separated in oxygen for breathing or hydrogen for rocket fuel. The moon is quite uniquely suited to prepare us and propel us to Mars and beyond. This is what we are building. This is what we're training for. This we can replicate throughout the solar system. This is the next chapter of human space exploration. Humans are the most fragile element of this entire endeavor, and yet we go for humanity. We go to the moon and on to Mars to seek knowledge and understanding and to share it with all. We go knowing our efforts will create opportunities that cannot be foreseen. We go because we are destined to explore and see it with our own eyes. We turn towards the moon now, not as a conclusion, but as preparation, as a checkpoint toward all that lies beyond. Our greatest adventures remain ahead of us. We are going. We're going. We are going. We are going. We're going. Can we have a proper thank you for, for Matt Abbott?